Today in series of Doplex's KL interviews, we have with us Dr. Krishna Shashadri, who is an endocrinologist in Chennai. He practices at the Fortis Malar Hospital. He has a vast experience of 19 years in his field. He's a member of American College of Physicians and American Endocrine Society. He's the Secretary of Endocrine Society of India. He's also the recipient of orations from RSSDI and ESI. Thank you so much for the interview. Thank you. So let's begin with the first question. Uh, is inflammation a cause of diabetes? I think so. Uh, over the years, there have been a lot of data that is accumulating, that is, that is pointing out in this direction as inflammation as being one of the causes of diabetes. So clearly, we know that, that the proximate cause of diabetes is beta cell dysfunction, but how we get there is a mm. series of, of events that occur that, that lead to the beta cell dysfunction. One of them is, is a primeval response that, that uh, animals and cells have, which is inflammation. So yeah. let us say we have a, an, an event, let us say an injury. How does the body protect itself? Through inflammation. If it is acute, there is a single attack, a single large response is mounted. But like how we abuse our body by, by eating and overeating, this is a chronic attack yeah. and therefore the body perceives it as a chronic insult. We have cells in our, in our stomach called the adipocytes. These adipocytes are meant to provide the body with emergency stores. So the brain is completely dependent on glucose. To protect the brain from, from times of starvation, we store. And what happens is uh, when we keep overdoing this, the body continues to store. But the attacking cells of the body perceive that there is something going on. So what happens is this, that there are these helper cells, these macrophages that invade the stomach or invade the abdomen mm -hmm. fat to ensure that there is, uh, uh, to find out what's going on and actually be a helper cell. But instead they undergo a shift. Mm -hmm. This is called a phenotypic shift where they actually, it's like having two bulls in a china shop. So you have the adipocyte, mm. which, which actually may, makes a lot of hormones called adipokines. And then you have these macrophages that make hormones called cytokines. Mm. And these feed on each other. So one feeds on the other. Okay. And one of the consequences of this is insulin resistance. So one of the things that happens is that the adipocyte at some point of time kills itself, undergoes death, apoptosis. Mm. So the fat that is meant to be stored and released in a fashion that helps the brain by diverting uh, glucose to the brain and non-essential stuff to the other places suddenly becomes systemic. Hmm. It goes into the liver and then it goes into the pancreas. And in each of these places, the same process of inflammation occurs. And in the end result of this, in the liver is insulin resistance. In the pancreas and the beta cell is beta cell dysfunction. And when beta cells do not produce sufficient amount of insulin, that's really what beta cell dysfunction is all about when you have diabetes. Right. Uh, so my next question is what happens to the beta cells in diabetes? Right. So for many years, we thought that, that diabetes was, was e either insulin resistance or beta cell dysfunction. We now know that without beta cell dysfunction, there is no diabetes. But for the last 10 years, uh, we have been thinking that it's just the death to the beta cell that occurs in diabetes. And now we know that that's not entirely true. We know that the beta cells not always die in diabetes. If you actually look at these cells, you will find that there is evidence of these cells not having insulin anymore or producing less amount of insulin, but not necessarily the indications of death, which is apoptosis. So what do we think is going on? What we think is going on is that there is a mechanism by which the beta cell is actually protecting itself. Remember, the beta cell consumes as much energy as a myocardial cell. It's a very important cell for the body. So what it does is it sort of changes its character. 
It's like a tortoise that goes into a shell and hibernates, waiting for better times to come. So as long as you're eating those extra jalebis and, 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 and sweets, these beta cells transform themselves into a cell that either produces glucagon, which is the alpha cell, or just goes back into being a cell that doesn't produce anything. The reason that this is important, and this process is called de-differentiation, is that for at least us conceptually, and, and, and there's no way that we know that this can happen in real life, is that these beta cells may regenerate that if the bad environment is taken away, if, if we stop our excesses or use the current, the, the medication that at some point of time we will develop, that will take care of this. We should be able to re-differentiate these beta cells. Sorry. So, so the answer, the, the reason why this is exciting is it provides a ray of hope to patients. We have been always telling that, you know, that by the time you're diagnosed that 80% 80, 80 of your beta cells are gone. So the way I would like to put it, and remember that now I'm moving on from evidence into conjecture, is that by the time you've diagnosed diabetes, 80% of your cells have gone to sleep. But you know, by losing weight and doing things right and taking your medications mm -hmm. and maybe some new drugs that come on the horizon, that some of them may wake up. And I think that's the hope that the new beta cell theory provides. Right. All right? Yeah. Okay. So moving on to the next one. Can you please talk about your work in the area of inflammation? So, uh, you know, uh, it takes it takes a lot of squirrels to b build that bridge. So I, I have a little part of that. So yeah. and the, my, my area of interest is inflammation and diabetes. Uh, two interesting things that we've done. Uh, one is uh, we've looked at... Uh, gut microbiota, which is, remember that we are all born with, we, we think that this body belongs to us, so do a trillion other bacteria. So uh, these trillion other bacteria that, that, that inhabit us, they, we are, they are maternally derived, that, that we get it from our moms and, and she from her mom and she yeah. from her mom. And, and these bacteria have lived with us and, and they actually are responsible for up to 10% of our metabolism. So what they do is they they, they digest some of the undigestible stuff and give you energy. Now, they've learned to live in this environment. They've learned to live in your street, and they actually help you. Yeah. So what happens when you start, when, when you go away from, 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 from let's say, a, a, a tight sadam diet like I have, and either we take a Punjabi diet or worse, go and, go and do uh, pizzas and burgers oh. every day. These bacteria don't like it. Yeah. Because they are used to certain amounts of energy and they change. So we've demonstrated in diabetes in, South, in the South Indian population that these bacteria are completely different. Okay. So all over the world we know that, that in diabetes that these bacteria change to a, to a different thing. And one of the hypotheses is that these cause inflammation and in our series we did show that there is, that one of the inflammatory markers that we measure, uh, monocyte chemotractin protein 1 is actually increased in the diabetic population. We did something interesting, which is even more fascinating for me, is that we that we extended this theory and looked at the oral microbiota. Okay. That we looked at the mouth. We have previously done work showing that diabetic patients, uh, there is there is, if you do scaling, their inflammation comes down. But this is something interesting because we looked at the oral microbiota and we showed that that the bacteria change, and we did something very interesting in that that we. We gave them a traditional way of brushing their teeth. We gave them neem stick, uh, which does not destroy the enamel, and asked them to uh, use it for three months. Okay. And then come back, and we measured their, again, we used monocyte chemotractin protein and showed that the inflammation had come down to zero. Okay. So our ancestors were probably not fools. So they were using some, some good stuff. Yeah. So this is the kind of work that they do. I'm currently working on, on circadian rhythms and the expression of a particular protein called FOXO, uh, which is again responsible for de-differentiation of the beta cells. So this, these are the areas that, that I am currently working on. I do a bunch of other clinical work, but to me this is the most exciting of the work that I do. Right. And of course, I do the word I encompasses a lot of we's in it because <laughs> these are the people who help do it. 
so my next question would be how are the newer drugs changing the management of diabetes ah significantly but the question remains is have we have we helped a lot of people because of that i think what we've had in the last few years is is drugs that address the various pathophysiological aspects of diabetes and in, importantly what these drugs have also done is 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 allow us to examine this new pathophysiology we would never have thought of the kidney as being an important cause of the pathology of diabetes we know it is one of the targets of diabetes but we've never talked about it as an important pathophysiologic cause of diabetes so this group of drugs have helped us in one way the second group of drugs of course is the glp1 receptor analogs which have pretty much uh, taken this by storm mm -hmm. and of course uh, we now for the first time have an anti inflammatory in india that has been uh, introduced as a as a drug in the management of diabetes so what you have is is more than you know one big revolution several small steps that have been that have extended our ability to help patients by giving different choices and very, this is very important in a nation like ours simply because while on the one hand you can dismiss these as being expensive stuff mm. it does extend your ability to take care of patients but the big thing is to stick to the basics and this is where we haven't done so well we haven't gotten enough people screened for retinopathy we still uh, don't examine feet well enough we mm -hmm. still don't uh, put in that statin in every patient we still don't get our blood pressures right and no, and and we still don't have our a1c's in the right place while we why why we are going to get some absolutely wonderful new drugs mm -hmm. in the future our ability to consistently deliver the care is what is going to make it uh as make make it important and may and make a mark on the care of each of our patients and and as a population it's very very important but there is also something else that we need to work on which we don't for example uh our focus is on on younger patient, younger people in the in the country and the economy one of the uh, things that has happened is our younger people that con who contribute so much to our economy are also the ones who are the most vulnerable to diabetes they work they don't have enough sleep they have they work work out of sync with clocks they are the ones who have who are on fast food they are the ones who don't get to exercise they don't have good lifestyle so at at the bottom of all of this is 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 a larger effort that is required to take care of this so we have some amazing new drugs amazing new therapies but we also need amazing new strategies right. to take care of this population right uh, so doctor uh, what happens to the brain in case of diabetes right now mine is getting addled but <laughs> but what happens in diabetes i think it's very interesting because we've learned a lot about we we never thought that insulin works too much in the brain because we never knew the kind of receptors mm -hmm. that are present but we now know that the brain is a target of insulin and many other wonderful hormones including leptin and also glp1 uh we also know that the that what happens in the in uh the brain in many conditions that includes diabetes is inflammation for example alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. is now considered to be like type 3 diabetes the same inflammatory markers that i talked about what is happening inside is 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 clearly uh, inflammatory markers are involved tnf alpha is involved so so that's what's happening in the brain we also know there's a significant loss of cognitive function that occurs in type 2 diabetes uh one of the reasons that we we eat a lot more is simply because inflammation is occurring in the hypothalamic areas but what is even more fascinating is that we know that when you when you get insulin or glp1 into the brain it actually reverses the insulin resistance that occurs elsewhere but also in the brain so for example intranasal insulin uh, reduces uh, uh, reduces some of the features of alzheimer's that are seen in the brain glp1 receptor analogs when given intranasally uh, are, are are now being thought of as one of the treatments for parkinson's disease and probably improve motor neuron and cognitive function so this is a very nascent area this is something that that is that has uh, not really caught the attention of a lot of people but 
is an exciting field because uh, of course the brain is the ultimate uh, frontier for anything that we do. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you here. It's wonderful. Thanks. Thank you.